aim, quite simply, is to become a central fundraising organization with the capacity to meet the financial requirements of voluntary groups in Elizabeth and Manapara, and at the same time, consolidate all local fundraising efforts into one annual appeal, and to eliminate, wherever possible, the constant badge days, appeals, and door knocks. This recording is presented to both Mrs. Ramsey, who has had, with her late husband Alec, a deep involvement in Elizabeth for many years, and to the South Australian Housing Trust archives. The occasion is a business luncheon for the launching of the Elizabeth and District Foundation's fifth annual fundraising appeal. The date is Thursday, June the 28th, 1979, and the venue is the Karawara Hotel, Elizabeth West. The patron of the foundation, His Excellency the Governor of South Australia, Mr. Keith Seaman, is in attendance. The speaker at the luncheon is former Premier Sir Thomas Playford, a legend in South Australia, and this is his address. Great pleasure to introduce to you the man, Sir Thomas Playford. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Thomas Playford. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you knew the risk that you ran when you invited me to come here today, but I can tell you that you run a very great risk indeed when you invite an ex-politician to a free feed and give him a captive audience, because I can assure you you're in real difficulty You can be in real difficulty, particularly if you don't set a time limit. Because uh, the day, Mr. Knight, when he brought me up here, I said, well now, how long do you want me to speak? Oh, he said, is it? And I thought, well, you, you're running a very big risk. But the first thing I want to say, Your Excellency, and I'm quite sure that you would agree with me in this, it is a delight to come to this district, to come to Elizabeth, uh, to sponsor and to be associated with a fundraising effort which is done so conscientiously, uh, so cheaply and so effectively. I think I can truthfully say that there's no place in South Australia and probably no place in Australia where the funds are raised so cheaply, so effectively and are uh, administered so well. And I personally am delighted that you gave me the invitation to come back here to Elizabeth. I have been up here before, many years ago, <laughs> to come back to Elizabeth to be associated with this fundraising foundation which you have so conspicuously, has been so conspicuously successful here in Elizabeth. When Mr. Knight asked me to come here today, he said that he wanted me to reminiscence, to give some reminiscences of the early days of Elizabeth. And uh, again I thought, well, you're running a risk, old man. You don't know what you're up against, because when you get very old people reminiscing, God help you. I would today, however, like to dispel one or two things. It's, near, it's now approximately a year since Mr. Alec Ramsey has died. And I think that one of the greatest losses to South Australia was his death, and certainly one of the greatest losses to Elizabeth was his death, because although I have had a certain amount of credit given to me with regard to the establishment of Elizabeth, let me say quite frankly that there is no one who was more res responsible for the es successful establishment of Elizabeth than Mr. Alec Ramsey. There was no greater friend of Elizabeth than Mr. Alec Ramsey. And, <coughs> as a matter of fact, at the time Elizabeth was established, you may not know, but we did not have a housing minister in this South Australia at all. There was no housing minister. There was no department of housing. 
the housing trust was run by a board and the, as far as I was concerned I was the treasurer of the state all I did was provide the money and uh, perhaps a little bit of advice from time to time but the big the big amount of work the planning the detailed work the long hours of doubt which no doubt some people had at that time they were all done by Mr. Alec Ramsey, Mr. Cartledge, and the members of the South Australian Housing Trust. When Mr. Knight asked me to reminisce about the establishment of Elizabeth, I wondered what particular story I would tell. I didn't know His Excellency was here today, or I wouldn't have chosen the subject I had chosen, which gets back ultimately to West End Beer. <laughs> but um, the position is this, that in a ma as a matter of fact, a part of uh, Elizabeth's present prosperity is uh, still based upon West End Beer. And I'll tell you how it happened. I got a letter, I can't put the date on this in the years, but it was after Elizabeth had been established and to, to a certain extent, at that time, we had planned a satellite town of approximately 20 to 25,000 people. That was the sort of setup that we were planning at that particular time. I got a letter from Sir James Holden to say that Mr. Donner, the president of General Motors, was coming to South Australia and would I like to meet him. I replied immediately that I would be delighted to meet Mr. Donner and Mr. Dorm, who was the general manager of General Motors Holden in Australia, and would they come and have lunch with me at Parliament House? I like Mr. Donner, but sometimes you meet people and you instinctively like them. You don't know quite why you like them. Uh, they may have some characteristic of somebody else that you like, but you don't know why you like them, but they you do like them, and I like Mr. Donner, and I think that he liked me, because he showed me a photo of his family, his wife and his family. That's a good sign, if you can get them on a family basis. After the lunch, he said to me, I want your advice, Playford. I said, uh, yes, Mr. Donner, it seems to be rather anomalous. You're getting a, a million dollars a year as an executive of the most successful motor company in the world and I'm getting $20,000 running a small state but for what it's worth I, I'm prepared to try what's the, what's the problem? He said well we're going to spend 30 million pounds in the extending the development of the car industry in Australia we're going to establish another factory where shall we put it? Now I ask you ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> uh, I said, well you embarrass me sir because you'll think that I'm uh, self-centered, but there's only one place to put it and that is Elizabeth. He said, can we get land out there? I said, yes, uh, you can get land and you can get land under very favorable conditions. He said, can I see it? And I said, yes, you can see it. I'll arrange for Mr. Ramsey to take you out uh, tomorrow morning. He'll pick you up at the hotel and take you out. And he will show you Elizabeth. He will explain what it's going to be, what it is, and what its future is. And he will be authorized to send you the necessary land. He said, all right, well, uh, nine o'clock tomorrow morning at the South Australian Hotel. After the gentleman had gone, I rang up Mr. Ramsey and I said, Alec, I want you to go down tomorrow morning and pick up Mr. Dorm and Mr. Donner and Sir James Holden to take them out to Elizabeth to sell them land for a, a factory to manufacture motor cars. Now, we're friends, Alec, and I want to make it quite clear if you fail in this mission, we are no longer friends. 
Now, I, I want to also make it clear that you don't get uh, worried about technicalities. If uh, Mr. Donner chooses a block of land and it's got the highways running through it <laughs> and he wants the highways shifted, don't argue the point, shift it. <laughs> don't make any, don't make any, don't make any technical objections whatsoever. He's a customer and you are to make this sale or we're no longer friends. When Mr. Ramsey came back, he said, well, I've made the sale, Premier, but I'm a little bit worried about it. I said, what's the matter, Alec? He said, well, I've sold them 300 acres of land, but it's, we don't own it. <laughs> you, uh, told, you told us not to be technically minded. And, uh, they, they nominated a block of land and uh, I sold it to them and I said well why, have, why, why don't we own it? I thought that before the plans for Elizabeth were ever made public that we bought all the land that we wanted and I, I thought we had all the land. He said well we have got all the land except this block <laughs> and I said why haven't we got this block? He said, well, it is owned by an elderly gentleman and he, quite frankly, is content to live where he is. He doesn't want the responsibility of uprooting himself, taking charge of money and going somewhere else. So that although we offered him a very good price, the fact is the more we offer him, the less inclined he is to go because he doesn't want the responsibility of the money. I said, well, that's all very well, Alec, but we've still got to get that land. Now, you go out on Monday morning, you yourself, and you do the transaction. Now, all that I've told you up to date, I can sign a statutory declaration for. The next lot I have to t tell you is how Mr. Ramsey told it to me on subsequent occasions. Mr. Ramsey went out early in the morning after the uh, dairy farmer who would presumably have milked his cows and he talked long and earnestly about the advantages of selling the land but uh, he wasn't doing very well in fact he didn't get inside the house until 12 o'clock at half past 12 he got to the stage of getting a cup of tea but just at that stage, there was a loud knock at the door and the lady of the house went to the back door and she came back and said to her husband or brother, we're not quite sure which, there's an officer from the Salisbury Council out there and he says we haven't registered our dog. Well, they looked under the clock in the mantelpiece for the receipt and it wasn't there and they became quite flurried about the dog registration until Alec felt that the atmosphere that he'd been building up through laboriously for three hours was gradually frittering away so he decided that he would uh, take a, a hand in the negotiation himself so he went out to the Salisbury officer and he said uh, to the Salisbury officer look I'm out here at the instruction of the Premier doing very important negotiations with these, uh, these gentlemen, this gentleman. Now you hop off, fade away, and come back about the dog another day. <laughs> but the uh, dog man had different views. He said, well now here's my authority. <laughs> Who are you to interfere with me in the execution of my duties? Uh, I'll go and get a constable. Uh, so that the uh, Finally, Alec put his own hand in his pocket and paid the dog registration fee. <laughs> but it didn't, of course, cure the problem because the farmer still felt that he should be funded to Alec. He feel, still felt that it was, uh, that had been done wrong. And uh, Alec said, oh, no, that's quite all right. But it, it was, the whole atmosphere was destroyed. 
So Alec decided that he would give it a, a spell for that day and try again. He said to the farmer, now, when do you come to town? He'd get him on his own ground, you see. <laughs> and the farmer said, well, no, I don't come to town, Mr. Ramsey. No, no. But he said, surely you have business in town. The farmer said, no, not really. He said, the only time I ever come down, I go to Kentown once a fortnight. I've got a, an allotment of malt waste, which I get from the brewery there. Uh, for uh, cows once a fortnight. Well, Alex said, uh, when, is, when is your next allotment due? He said, oh, next Tuesday. Alex said, I'll come out and help you load it. <laughs> so, on the, by arrangement, and Tuesday afternoon, uh, Alec Ramsey, the general manager of the housing trust, <laughs> went out uh, to assist in loading, I think it was 15 barrels of malt waste on the truck, at the Barrett's nurse at the Barrett's Molsters. It was a hot day. The farmer was, I say, he was like me, getting a little bit past the prime. He wasn't 83 yet, but he was getting past the prime. Alec was not robust, as you know. He was not a, a hefty gentleman. Anyway, they struggled with the the 15 or 18 barrels of malt waste and finally got it loaded up and tied down. And the farmer said to Alec, you know, this, uh, this malt factory is not owned by parents at all. This malt factory is owned by the West End Brewery. They bought this malt factory. And I'll tell you something else, Ramsey. I know a place around the back here where we can get a free pot of beer. <laughs> so, Alec and his friend proceeded to go around to the back of the malt house somewhere or other that the farmer knew about anyway. And the farmer shouted Alec a free pot of beer. As I say, it was a, a hot day and it was a cool, cool beer and it was very acceptable. So Alec returned the hospitality and shouted the farmer a free pot of beer. And they extended hospitality and sh shouted each other free pots of beer, <laughs> as gentlemen would do. Until we got to the stage where the farmer said to Alec, now look Ramsey, I'd like to sell you that land if uh, I didn't have to administer the money. If I could get out of having to administer the money, I would like to sell you that farm. So Alec decided that that was a treasurer's job then, so he rang me up from the barrack in the, the malt house and said, well, we can do the sale if uh, you can find some way of relieving the uh, farmer, our farmer friend, of administering the money. And I said, that's quite simple, Alec. There's no problem at all. I hereby appoint you as his attorney. <laughs> so, we sold, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure of these figures, as I, as I was, say, uh, as I have to sign a statute of declaration. I'm not quite sure of these figures now. But the sale involved something along these lines, 300 acres of land, and the price was 750 pounds an acre. And Alec Ramsey was uh, the administrator and had to look after the finances. As a matter of fact, the, I thought it was rather a good joke, and I wrote to Donna, and I told him how we'd sold him land which we didn't own. I got a reply back very promptly. He said, well, we're not going to use very much of that land for a long time ahead. I would be very pleased if you would advise Mr. Ramsey to tell the, the dairy farmer that he is to live on the land for the rest of his life free of interest and free of any cost. So 
So that was the position, and the, as you see, the foundation of the motor industry in uh, Elizabeth ultimately depended upon, I don't know whether it was two pots of beer, or four, or six, or eight, or ten. All I do know, it was an even number. <laughs> I uh, tell this story, Your Excellency, to emphasize just what a public servant Alec Ramsey was. <laughs> there was nothing that he wouldn't do uh, to see that the enterprises that he was instructed to look after were carried out. There was nothing he wouldn't do to give a com compassionate uh, administration to the housing trust of the state. He was one of the greatest public servants South Australia has ever had. And uh, I'm here in Elizabeth today uh, to say that if Elizabeth is a success, and I believe it is an undoubted success, it is due to the efforts of Alec Ramsey and, and the work that he put into it. Now, you can make and continue to make Elizabeth a success by supporting your own foundation. And I'm quite sure that the foundation is in good hands. It's in your hands, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you successfully continue to support it. And I thank you very much indeed for the very high honour you've given me today in coming out here. I was an old friend of Elizabeth many years ago, coming out here again to see what you have achieved. Your Excellency, governments can't make towns. Governments can build houses, but they can't make towns. People make towns. The community spirit makes a town. The society of a town is much more when it's all said and done than the buildings that the people occupy. And the spirit is occupied out here. The, people, the spirit has been generated in such a short time, I believe, gives the utmost, should give the utmost pride to, pride to the people that are living in Elizabeth. I wish it well for the future, and I thank you very much very sincerely for giving me the invitation of coming here today to support your foundation appeal. very much sir Thomas you make us feel very humble ladies and gentlemen I would now like to call on our past president mr. Harry Knight to conduct the vote of thanks mr. Knight I told you earlier didn't I that it was going to be a, a tremendous moment mr. chairman your Excellency, it gives me a tremendous thrill to propose this vote of thanks on, all, uh, on behalf of all those present today. Whether this comes out good, bad, or indifferent, Sir Thomas, it will certainly come from my heart. In the beginning, I'd like to say thank you indeed for the precious time that you've given us to talk to us like you have and to reminisce with us. Ladies and gentlemen, you've all heard of the play for common touch and now you've all experienced it. Some two or three weeks ago, when I rang Sir Thomas and asked him if he'd do this job for us, he said, well, now don't forget, I'm an 83-year-old man and I have a bad heart. And uh, I said, well, look, no worries, Sir Thomas. No, no worries. We were only hoping 
And uh, this was his reply. Now, wait a moment. I haven't turned it down yet. <laughs> now, uh, uh, just, uh, just how wonderful can you get? So we've, uh, we've had a glimpse of this, this man, this man's approach and his manner. I suppose there's a million stories that could be told about Sir Thomas and probably they're all true. But uh, I would like perhaps to highlight the respect that Sir Thomas has been held in by his opposition. And this happened uh, many years ago and uh, it was when uh, Mr Arthur Caldwell was visiting South Australia and uh, uh, that gentleman, of course, was uh, the man that came within one seat of being uh, Australia's Prime Minister. And he was being uh, interviewed on a TV station and uh, uh, they said to him, uh, well, what do you think of uh, South Australia's politics? And he said, uh, and just as sincerely as ever Sir Tom could say anything, he said, I have no quarrel with Tom Payford's politics. So uh, that's another glimpse of the man. Um, as a younger man, making his way in the political world, in the Butler government he was given his first opportunity to be a minister. So like any man, he was proud and went home and he told his wife that he'd be made a minister. And this in front of a daughter. So uh, when uh, Sir Thomas left the room, a uh, daughter said to mother, Mummy, uh, what church is Daddy being made a minister of? <laughs> Sir Thomas, I suppose that one of your proudest moments must have been your knighthood, the award by the Queen. But I just wonder, sir, if anybody, if you could be prouder than the award the South Australian people gave to you when they called you Honest Tom. Honest Tom Playford. That, sir, is the image that you reflected throughout all of those years. I suppose I could go on for hours saying thank you, but I'm not, I mustn't. I can't. But I would like to say this, that like lots of people in this room, uh, we all have our pin-ups that inspire us. And uh, my male pin-ups over the last 30 or 40 years, and I have had female pin-ups that have inspired me. <laughs> my uh, male pin-ups over the last uh, 30 or 40 years uh, have been Sir Winston Churchill, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Sir Mark Oliphant, Mr. Ben Chifley, Sir Thomas Playford. <laughs> Sir Thomas, you're a great Australian. But more importantly to us, you're a magic South Australian, and we thank you for it. Sir, so, we have some flowers here that uh, I'll bring over to you uh, that we would like you to take home to Lady Playford from us all at Elizabeth. And I would like to say, on behalf of this city of Elizabeth, God bless you both.